Okay, everyone. So we're going to continue our talk on um, about ions and essentially what makes an ion. How do we know what the charges will be? And um, we haven't let yet looked at what happens if we want to draw an ion. So um, just to kind of recap, ions are essentially when atoms have either gained or lost uh, electrons. So remember that metals will lose electrons. They're the ones that will do the giving away. And then non-metals are going to be the ones that are gaining. Okay, so these are non-metals. Um, so the whole point of creating an ion is to create a stable octet. Or think of it as it wants the outermost shell to be completely full. So this is a very simplified picture here. So this is not a true Bohr-Rutherford because there's no protons and neutrons here. We kind of get the idea. So sodium is in group number one. It has one valence electron. So what happens is it will then lose that electron and it has this full shell that's underneath. So when it becomes an ion, and this is what we're going to talk about is how do we draw this, um, but essentially when it becomes an ion it will have a positive one charge. So if you remember, Sodium, like regular sodium atoms, have 11 protons and 11 electrons, right, making it zero. But when you have lost an electron, we have 11 protons, but then we have only 10 electrons. So that's where that positive one is coming from. And we no longer call it an atom, it's an ion. So whenever you say the word atom, that means protons are equal to electrons. The word ion means that they are not equal. There's either more protons or more electrons, depending on if it's gaining or losing electrons. So how are you gonna know what the ion charge is? So if you remember, I did give you that little um, kind of not trick, but uh, kind of pattern that exists. So the periodic table will help you um, to know what the charges will be. But of course, it's important to know that metals will lose electrons. So metals will always become positive. Non-metals will gain electrons, so they will always become negative, right? Because there's like more negatives there. So the pattern that exists is basically everything in group number one will lose one electron because it has one valence electron. Everything in group two will lose two. Group number three have three valence electrons. Group number four have four, five, six, seven, and then eight are the noble gases, except uh, helium is um, only two because the outer shell is the first one which can only hold a maximum of two. So knowing how many valence electrons something has will help us to know how many it has to gain or lose. Uh, so a couple of, one other term, kind of terminology that we haven't yet looked at. So when metal atoms actually become ions, they have a, a different name or like a category name. So positive ions are called cations. So, um, and, and that goes for anything that is, has a positive charge. So sodium ions, magnesium ions, any metal ion is called a cation. It's kind of like the category it belongs in. So think of like, um, I don't know, cats. Maybe cats are positive. We like cats. Um, but uh, you have to remember that cations mean that it's positively charged. Non-metals, because they're gaining electrons, are negative, and all negative ions go under the category of being an anion. So looking at the periodic table that we use, uh, we can actually, you know, just look at the charge that's in the top right-hand corner. Now it's important that you understand where the charge is coming from, like why is it positive 2, why is it positive 3 or negative 3, um, but it is there as a kind of a helpful reminder, right? So I just kind of took a little snippet. So you have like positive 3, negative 3, negative 1. Remember this has to do with what is being gained or lost. So if something is negative 3, Right, so let's take a look. There's five valence electrons. That makes sense. If you start with five valence electrons, it has to gain three more to get to the eight. 
Aluminum has three valence electrons, so it will lose that outer shell with three. Now the ones that have dashed lines, okay, so you notice all the noble gases and some of the metalloids, not all of them, but some, don't have a charge. Okay, and the reason why you have some elements that don't have charges can be one of two reasons. One reason is that it does not form molecules or compounds. So the, all the noble gases, the noble gases do not make a compound. And the reason why is because they already are stable. So all these noble gases have the stable octet. So they're not making any ions at all. Now some of the other ones though, like carbon, boron, silicone, you can see a few here, they don't have a charge, but they can still make compounds. The reason why they have a dash is actually because they tend to share electrons. So all the ones that have a charge mean that they could give and take, right? So if it's a metal, it will give away. If it's a non-metal, it will take. But if it has the dash line, that means actually it prefers to share electrons. So naturally, carbon, for example, carbon likes to form molecules with other non-metals. So two non anything that has two or more non-metals are sharing electrons, not transferring. So you'll see carbon with other non-metals quite a bit. So like just for an example, right, carbon dioxide is a compound that has carbon and oxygen. So there are two non-metals, so these guys are sharing. So don't worry so much right now. We're going to focus on ionic compounds. We're going to spend some more time talking about molecular compounds or the sharing molecules. Um, but for now, we'll focus on the ions and how to draw them and how to kind of work with the ion charge. Okay, so we are going to look at drawing Lewis diagrams for ions. So we've done the Lewis diagrams for atoms, but we haven't done it for ions yet. So we will always do Lewis diagrams for ions. So you will not be doing Bohr-Rutherford for ions because we're going to start building molecules and different, different kinds of structures. And it's always going to be easier to do it with um, a Lewis instead of a Bohr, Bohr-Rutherford. So um, I know sometimes in your textbook, so you might see Bohr-Rutherford of ions. It's pretty much the same thing. It's just that you have to draw all of the orbits and the nucleus, whereas we're just focused on the valence electrons. So the rules are here. Um, so you, essentially, just like with a Lewis diagram, you write the symbol, and then we have the valence electrons. But we are now going to change the number of valence electrons because remember, it's either going to gain electrons or lose them. So we have to show that this new thing is an ion, it's not an atom. So we do that by drawing a square bracket around the symbol. And this will make more sense once you see some examples. And the charge is always written on the upper right-hand corner of the bracket. So it'll look like this, and in the top right-hand corner, we're going to put the charge. Again, this will make sense when we start doing examples. Okay. So magnesium, what we're going to do is we're going to do the Lewis diagram of the atom, and then we're going to do the ion, okay? So the atom, we have the symbol, and you're going to look on the periodic table to see the number of valence electrons. Magnesium has two. It's in group number two. So here is magnesium. This is like atoms. Okay? The ion... So remember, ion means like it's gained or lost electrons. Because this is a metal, we know that it's going to lose electrons. So magnesium is going to lose those two. So how we do this is we draw the symbol. And we're going to put brackets. And we're not going to draw those dots in. Remember that the ion means that these dots are gone. They've been lost. So when we draw the ion, we're actually going to show that it is now empty on that outer shell. 
but we have to put the charge in the top right hand corner to say that it's an ion. So basically when you're looking at a picture, how you know it's an ion is you're going to see brackets and then the charge. If you do not see brackets, that means automatically it's for an atom. So metals should be empty on the inside of the bracket. Oxygen, we're going to do the regular atom. So oxygen is in group 16, which means it has six valence electrons. So now oxygen is a non-metal which means oxygen is going to gain electrons. So remember, it gains however many it needs to be full. So oxygen needs two more. So what we're going to do, here's our oxygen, here's the brackets. So we need to show that now oxygen has a full octet. So there should be eight dots around. And of course, in the top right hand corner, we put what the charge is. So remember, this is negative two because it has two extra electrons than what it had before. So not, metals should be empty, non-metals should be full. Okay, so pause the video for a second. Um, so just pause it and then I want you to try this out. Draw the atom for each of these, then draw the ion and then hit play and see how you do. Okay, so sulfur is in group 16. It has six valence electrons. We'll do all the atoms first. Calcium is in group two, so it has two valence electrons. Fluorine is in our halogen group, so it has seven valence electrons. And then aluminum is in group 13. It has three valence electrons. So sulfur, is a non-metal. So sulfur is going to have its full octet. It's gaining two electrons. And then the charge is negative two. Calcium is a metal, which means it is going to lose those electrons. So it's going to be empty. The charge is positive two. Fluorine has seven. So that means it's going to gain only one to make its stable octet. So the charge on fluorine would be negative one. And aluminum has three valence electrons. This is a metal. So we're going to have aluminum and it's going to be empty because it's losing those three which make the charge positive three. Hopefully you did well on that one. So the key is like identify if it's a metal or non-metal. That will help you to know if it's gaining or losing. And then of course the charge depends on how many electrons it's gaining or losing. Now keep in mind, you can write this, the periodic table actually has the symbols backwards. It says like two positive instead of positive two. That's fine, it means the same thing, okay? Um, we've actually already gone over this. So ionic bonds are made between a metal and a non-metal. Electrons are transferred from the metal to the non-metal. We know that because metals lose, non-metals will gain. And the last couple here are just showing you some examples of ionic bonding. So the name of what we're doing here is we're creating ionic compounds. And how we do that is through an ionic bond. So the transferring of electrons is technically called an, an ionic bond. So like the positive and negative ions that are made afterwards have an attraction for each other because they are opposites. So this is an example showing you view with um, showing all the different orbits. So like I said, we will only be doing Lewis structures, but it's the same idea. It's just showing you the transfer from the metal to the non-metal, and now we have the charges with the brackets. So those are called ionic compounds. So here you have, it's like the same thing again, it's just showing it to you. It's just showing you with a different type of picture. And actually, this is a nice one. What it's looking at is how the ions look afterwards. All the positives are attracted to the negative. So it's almost like a little cube, right? So all ionic compounds actually take on this exact same structure. Positive and negative attract. 
And then this is our last example. So we're going to do some more about this next week. But this is just showing you how the two are attracted. So if I have a positive and negative ion, they will attract.